Appreciate y'all bearing with us. Uh, hopefully we got all the kinks out the way. A couple te technical difficulties. Um, but we, we back. We back. Either way, we're going to make it work. We're going to make it work. So fingers crossed. We get Quran in here, y'all. Cross them fingers. You know, say a quick little prayer. Let's get Quran in here. Let me see. Let me see. Let everybody know we making it happen. We ain't going to stop. We going to figure it out. All right, we getting them back. We getting y'all back in here. What's happening, y'all? Just waiting for Quran. She about to come back in. Once she come back in, we're going to get y'all fired. Make sure y'all going to sure get fired. There we go. Ah. J-Rock, what's happening, bro? Yeah. Quran, I don't know. I think Instagram hating on us. They know he was going to bring them some heat. Man, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make it happen. Trying to make it happen. We got Karan coming on here. We just trying to get the connection real quick. We have issues with this with the Instagram. But Karan talking about how to make flip these houses and make six figures off of them. She killing it. Hold on, y'all. We about to. Karan, you still don't see no two people at the bottom? Because I see you in the comments, but I don't see you as a guest still. I, I, I don't know. I, somebody might have hacked your page. I think you DM me too, Loyal to Life, about the sheriff cell. So the sheriff cell is a different animal. Um. J Rock, you saying you want to talk about it or you want want me to get somebody on here to talk about it? <laughs> but loyal to but loyal to life in regards to the sheriff's cell question. Um So just keep in mind when you buy sheriff's cell, it's one of them situations where you gotta buy cash most of the time. And if you buy from the tax cell, um uh, you know, I can't wait to have you, J-Rock. I got you. Um, but when you buy from the sheriff's sale, you got to keep in mind that those properties, you basically don't get a free and clear title for like, I think, nine months or, or 12 months. So the issue is, you know, say, for instance, if you need to take out a credit card or a line of credit on that house, you really can't start building or doing anything on that house because you'll know if you're going to free and clear credit uh, title for nine to 12 months until the sheriff's sale clear that deed. If you do tax sale, if you do mortgage sale, you could pretty much get busy right away. Um, but like I said, I'm not the best person to talk to about sheriff sale because I never did a deal at the sheriff sale. I hear good things about it, but not necessarily my lane. Dun dun dun! Yeah. Nuts. Okay. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> Told you somebody tried somebody did something to your page or something. They they, they 
that out. I have to see what's going on, but yeah, that was. But it's all right. We still got you, Queen. We still got you. We are glad to have you. Look and look. The people was waiting. They 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 not disappointed. It's all good. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So, so for those who don't know, this is Miss Karan Nicole. Um, the name was Impact. What's the name of your company? Impact. It's Impact Investment and Design Firm. This is Miss Flip a House, Get Six Figures, Nothing Less, Make It Happen, Captain. So, guys, go ahead. You go, you go introduce. You go ahead, introduce. Let me shut up. Yeah, so I'm Karan Nicole. I own Impact Investment and Design Firm, where we design, build, and stage homes. So, well, design, renovate, and stage homes. Um, I have been uh, investing in real estate for probably about three years now. Um, came up with some really cool strategies um, day to day, just all day handling um, different ends of the transaction, whether it's working with the wholesalers or the lenders, um, different agents, contractors. It's just, you know, all day, every day, real estate um, kind of, you know, I'm like the boots on the ground, you know, we're pulling permits and managing the renovations and designing properties and sourcing and buying materials and figuring out kind of how to manage those costs and all that fun stuff. So I'm super excited to be here with you guys tonight. Obviously, we've been doing a lot of speaking, a lot of teaching, a lot of books. Um, just we feel like it's our responsibility. We are very passionate about uh, creating generational wealth and uh, sharing our strategies and helping everybody get to, you know, the same um, finish line that we are working towards each day so we come and we do these lives and we share kind of our best practices and things that we want you guys to avoid um, in the process after doing this for years and years and years we have figured out what's going to work and what will not work so um, we're happy to be here tonight and i know you guys have some really good questions um, and i see a lot of you guys are investors and newbies, and it's a, just a really nice mix. We got agents, so it's going to be a great conversation. Thanks, Anthony, for having me. Uh, no problem. Um, so first question for you, you talked about this on your last live, but in regards to just getting started, like, let's just go back real quick and give them, like, the foundation. Do I need to save money or do I need to work on my credit or do I need to do both? Well, you know, you know my story. You've heard it a hundred times. We do a lot of, you know, we've done Clubhouse and all that. We introduce ourselves every hour on Clubhouse. So you, uh, my story is um, both. I got in position. When it comes to real estate, you do need to spend some time getting in position. You can't just jump out there. I know there's a lot of advertising going on about, you know, how to get into the game with no credit, no money down. I do not recommend getting into real estate without cushion and without being financeable and being a solid borrower, meaning that um, you have some stable money, whether it's income or business or investments that you're already, you know, working on. Your credit is stable, right? So you're proven to be a stable borrower. Um, so real quick, Anthony, your question was, should you get your credit together or pull some money together? So what, so yes, should you work, should I work on my credit first or should I work on getting the money up first or do I need both? Both. You need both. You, investing is not something that, okay, you hear everybody flipping properties. I want to get rich quick. I need to do it. Getting yourself together financially is something every single person should do. And especially when you take on liabilities, meaning that you're borrowing money or, you know, whatever strategy you use for acquiring properties, something could go wrong and you want to be able to back it. You want to have strong enough credit where if you need to go grab a loan, you can. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about putting yourself in, good, in the right position. The first step to real estate is getting in position, doing a ton of research, working with people that are already doing it, getting your credit in order as best as possible. We all have student loans and things like that, but you want to put yourself in the best possible situation. Um, and Anthony and I talk about strategies for buckling down for newbies, right? Put your freeze, everything that you're doing, all your spending, everything that um, is not a need. Like I wrote, I just wrote a book. It's called one flip away from six figures. And the whole first half of the book is about mindset. It's about discipline. It's about money, right? So how are you basically going to finance this new dream? Like you're, you're a new investor. You're a new real estate investor. Right. You have to be a solid individual 
before you can be a new real estate investor, which means clean your credit up, put a few bucks in the bank, buckle down. We talked about ways to find money within your budget. Like if you um, look at all your small purchases, whether it's coffee or Ubers or DoorDash, like there is so much money in your existing budget that you can find. Sure, that, and it's because to me, it's like most times people want to get in position and they start to try to cut out like big purchases. It's not big purchases that are hurting us. It's little purchases. It's like that slow leak we all talk about, um, you know, overspending on little stuff. There's a time for that. Once you have investments, and you're bringing in um, monies from your different ventures, then you can splurge on things. But until you're an investor where you're bringing in some sort of solid cash flow, you got to be like, I'm broke. You have to live like you're broke. You have to, you know, monitor every single expense. Um, so yeah, that discipline is around your spending is how mm -hmm. you're going to come up with you know, the money you're going to need to fix your credit and to get into the game to have, you know, whether it's 10,000, 20,000, 25,000 to get you into know, the but game. But don't be, don't be, don't be being modest. Don't sugarcoat it. Tell them about how much you saved up for that deal we did. Okay. So you want me to tell my story again? <laughs> they, they, see, we got a lot of new people who, you know, who tune in. So yes, yeah. give, give them your, your first deal. Walk yeah. them through that, please. Yeah. So just you know this is home court based for me my first deal happened anthony was the wholesaler on my deal um because i was in position i started out in the looking to buy one property and because i had solid credit and because i had pulled together fifty thousand dollars which our history culturally is not that we have anybody that's just going to pass us down a hundred thousand dollars to get started in different ventures so when you're looking to get into you know whatever it is whether it's real estate opening a business you know flipping cars whatever you're going to be doing um you know you got to have some cash so i just went on a very aggressive saving spree which i call a spending freeze where I did not buy anything that was not like an absolute necessity. I did, for an entire year, I got a roommate. Um, I put my student loans on deferment because I was at the time paying like $900 a month. So I put my student loans on deferment. And I just did like all kinds of little radical stuff. Like I stopped eating out completely um, and all that fun stuff. And uh, like no expensive coffee, none of that. And I was able just from that, you know, saving $900 for my student loans and saving whether it was $1,500 from getting a roommate. So I was saving like three, $4,000 a month from just finding money within my budget, buckling down and being extremely uncomfortable for an entire year. I'm still, you know, even though I'm three years in, I'm still living very uncomfortable. Like I don't buy shoes or any of that kind of stuff anymore i you i was a diva and i was into all of that before i started to see my money as an opportunity to make more money right. you know prior to being an investor it was about living my life it was about being happy it was about going to work until five o'clock and coming home and what's for dinner what 40 50 dollar dinner am i gonna have what you know 40 dollar bottle of wine am i gonna drink what exotic vacation am i gonna take or new, new shoes and the range rovers and the rolex watches and i was like totally into all of that but after you know kind of seeing all right i put together fifty thousand dollars from stopping stop i stopped doing that bs right and then i got very uncomfortable and then i've learned how to live uncomfortable so it's going to be a while before i kind of go back to enjoying my life um because I don't have enough assets, in my opinion, to pay for that lifestyle. So you're delaying your fun or the, 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 the gratification now to really be in position and really do what you want when you want it later on. Yeah, like I think, you know, most of us do that. Like a lot of times, you'll, you guys will even notice, like small things. When we get on live, we got on $15 shirts. <laughs> I pay 15 bucks to get this printed. I wear it every day. I wear the black one. I wear the to match. <laughs> and I do that for a couple reasons. One, I don't want to pick out my, this is another little hack. Everything is about hacks. I don't want to pick out clothes. I don't want to have one more decision to make. I use all my decisions for real estate because there's 20, 30 decisions right, right. all day long, wins and losses all day long. This is up 20 grand, down 12 grand. You know what I mean? Like, right phone calls, issues, BS, the whole nine. So uh, when it comes to buying clothes, like 
I've stopped doing that, you know, um, just because over time, like you're spending two, three thousand dollars a month on little stuff, you know, right. on and different things like that, where that's a lot of times where you guys can find some extra money. So we'll move on to a different topic. But I firmly believe that you have money within your current budget that you can utilize to buy real estate. You know, if you save it up and if you're super disciplined, um, that you're not paying attention to. You have to be very, very intentional about everything as far as your time and your money. Gotcha. And in regards to how do you feel about building building wealth? Are you a big believer in like, you know, flip, flip, flip and just stack your money from flipping? Or do you believe in rentals, you know, from the bird method as well? Um, so I don't do the burr method. And the reason I don't do the burr method is because I am petrified of becoming over leveraged. Um, okay. My approach to wealth development is flip. And then, um, you know, if the margins aren't six figures, and we'll get into that, because I, you know, I've specialized in my strategy where, you know, I, I'd never made less than $50,000 on a flip and I'm up to making a hundred thousand dollars per flip. And if it's not, the margins aren't six figures, then that's when I will decide to hold. Um, and holding. Whoa, whoa. You, you try to, you slid that in there. Come on, come on. Come back with some more. No. So starting out, your goal was, all right, I'm a, I'm a use, I'm a use 50,000 as my goal for my flips. Yeah. And you pulled that, you pulled it off. I was a witness. I was a witness. You set the count in, in Overbrook real quick. Yeah. Um, but then now you said, now you have moved up to where 50,000 is cool. That's cute. Yeah. But now that we roll into the $100,000 flips, which you're currently yeah. working on. Yeah. And the reason that I, I operate that way is because these flip projects are a lot of work. Fix and flip, real estate investing, <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot I of you can't keep rock on the on the old stuff and, and just throw some floors and paint. I can't. No, no. You know, it's all, you know, my strategy is about being very, very intentional from the time you're sourcing deals, right? So you're analyzing deals. This is the time where you begin with the end in mind. I'm going to make $100,000 off this flip. And it's not as difficult as you think. You will need to work within higher margins, meaning that, comps will have to be somewhere around 300,000 and up, right? Because the $100,000 profit margin will not work on a $160,000 home that's the full gut, right? right. So when you buy your deal in the very beginning, you cannot overpay for it. You know, we talk about this as investors a lot. You make your money at the table. Right. So when you say you make your money at the table, that means that if you are an over anxious new investor and you pay thirty thousand dollars above what you should pay for that property just because you wanted to be a real estate investor and get in the game you lost thirty thousand clean dollars that you could have made from the very beginning and when we say clean money any type of projection like if my projection is always going to be a hundred thousand dollars or mm -hmm. more right that's a projection and that's why my book is kind of like one-off situations it's not the rule it's this it's an exception to the rule some people are happy with making 30 40 50 thousand my my strategy it's very intentional and it doesn't always work because your projection is a hundred thousand on every single phase of a renovation project on a fix and flip investment project oh, you go. lose money <laughs> every phase except buying at a great price that's why you make your money at the table you don't miss the opportunity to to make an extra ten thousand twelve thousand you negotiate those deals so if someone comes to you with a property and they say hey listen it's going to be 60 grand don't you ever pay 60 grand for it you know leverage your relationships leverage the fact that you're a repeat buyer you're a strong <laughs> buyer right you pull out your portfolio hey bud look I just bought all these properties. I'm working on these over here. I got right. the funds. I'm a strong buyer. What, what can you do on the price? You know, can I give you 50000 Because that money, when you negotiate good deals in the beginning and you save money, that's the only guaranteed money you're going to make in a flip. But okay. to answer your question, um, rentals are always a good idea. So I flip because of my strategy and I've been successful with 
you know, sticking with the strategy, as well as I have a design firm. So in my design firm, I, you know, I'm real fancy and radical about my projects. And I've built a whole nother business where we pretty much design these properties for other investors now, which is like a no brainer, you know, and then I have the staging company. So I utilize my flips as marketing and advertising for my other two businesses. So I'm always going to flip. And then I always follow the one, the, the six figure strategy. Um, but eventually like the name of the game is condos. <laughs> like I want like 30 to 50 to 200, 300 condo units. You know what I mean? So you start mm -hmm. and you work your way up on the rental side. Um, and you have, you know, that money rolling in every month. So for those who don't know, the condos, what's, what's a condo, Karan? So it's basically like the multifamily syndication that you guys hear a lot about. It's like when someone goes in and they buy a condo building they, or they buy an apartment, let's just say apartment. They buy an apartment building with 200 apartment units or, you know, start sm small, 25. That's kind of the smallest that I would think, but you know. It's the association that runs it. Yeah, and then, yeah, so the condos would be the condo association, but if you bought a apartment building with 25 apartments, that's more of a guaranteed investment, in my opinion, because, one, you have rent coming in from 25 different doors. So if you're mm -hmm. down, you know, a few months, a few units, you're still good, right? right. Property is growing equity. So, you know, at some point, you know, if you want to sell that, if it's like for five years go by and now it's worth two, three times what you paid, you could flip out of that for large amounts of money. Um, and I just think when you do a duplex or a triplex, it's like so much liability with tenants, you know, whether they're, you know, going to pay or is the economy mm -hmm. wild. I think the more doors you have with focusing on larger condo and apartment um, development, is a big deal like i read a lot of books about you know that's where the real wealth is at like what we're doing right now i don't know if you feel this way anthony but it's like we're building our way up to bigger deals so if you're you know investing and you're flipping right um, times we're using that money to buy more debt so if we make a hundred thousand dollars that means now i can go borrow five hundred thousand dollars with my hundred thousand dollars and do right. bigger deals and that's the growth that you have to get into because it's, you know, it's risky. These little deals, you know, they're time consuming. You want to get into some real big money <laughs> at some point. Not, so it's funny you said that. I just was talking to my folks, Jackson Rental Homes today, and I'm like, I feel like I learned all the wrong stuff. But again, it depends on where you come from. So again, I learned from people who was getting into the real estate because they was trying to get out of other stuff that they was doing that was just quick money. Sure. So, Realist, like you said, is levels to it. So, like, you start out with the residential and you do a house, three-bedroom, two-bedroom, work your way up. Then, like you said, you start moving. That was like, all right, I could buy a rental. I could do a flip. That's cool. But now they got a whole nother world and exposure changes things. So now you're talking about condos. I'm talking about condos and new construction. New construction so is good. Doing, uh, a triplex, I got condo units, like, my, like Big Homie LeVar and Mike Holloway, you could sell the condo units and keep a unit and it'll pay for itself free and clear. And the rent is twice the amount of money in a new construction condo unit. Or like you said, imagine taking that money and going to move up and buy an apartment building. Now I don't got to ride around the city to go check on 20, 30 houses. I got 30 tenants in one building and I got a property manager that deals with all the people in one situation. That's it. Yeah. So I think what, yeah, I think what we're trying to say, and you'll notice like guys like LeVar, they're starting to get up, you know, five, 10, 15 units. They're growing, right? So again, what we're trying to say is there's always uh, evolution in the game. When it, we start, I, for me, I'll speak for myself. I started with nothing. I started at zero. I flipped a little bit, made some money, did some other projects. I'm doing other things. But the end goal is to own a lot of real estate cash producing assets right so these are assets that are continue to pay you right so say for instance you own an apartment building and i don't want to mean to put this so far advanced i know we have some newbies but if you own an apartment building that has 25 units and you decide not to sell it for the rest of your life your kids life your kids kids like 
once you figure out how to buy an apartment building with 25 units in it that right. you have renovated, it's not like the little hell hole, it's a really nice quality place to live, you're going to have that forever or you're going to be taking the money out to buy bigger projects forever, right? So for the rest of your life, let's say you cash flow somehow, some way, you cash flow $1,000 a month. For the rest of your life, you got $25,000 coming in to your your, your your mailbox every month for the rest of your life. That should be everybody's goal. How you get there is that in-between stuff that you and I can talk for hours about, the day-to-day -day strategies that every single real estate investor has different. We all have very different approach to investing. Um, we can get specific about my approach, talk about some of my best practices, strategies, things that has gone wrong, where I'm at process so b before we do that though let's talk about the mental part of it because like you because you said hey i started here i'm going here i did this and now i'm trying to go here with the larger apartment so like how do you face your fears or what is it that you're telling yourself that makes you confident to go and keep growing yeah so um one of the things the major uh keynotes in my book is mindset strategy execution well, all right, time out time out because you said it. They didn't say nothing earlier you said your book but you yeah. didn't us. so are you are you telling us that your your book is on the way yeah so it should be ready in like another week or two basically it's a strategy book it's a right, strategy so what's book. the title can we know the title of course you can so it's a strategy book and it's one flip away from six figures so it oh. teaches you the strategies to profit six figures within one flip. And it's a guide, it's a strategy book. So if for some reason you lose $10,000, you know, on the second phase and now you had 90,000, that's a lot better than if your your strategy was 40, 50,000, right. right? So if your gauge is always $100,000, that means a couple things. One, you buy at the right price. Two, you're managing the renovation every single day, all day. You're making sure you're doing what you have to do not to lose any money during your renovation process. And three, you're picking a good agent on the resale to be sure that your house is not sitting on the market for three, three four months. Well, that is on. priced. Go ahead. No, finish, finish. Oh, you, that. Got you got and, it. I mean, I was, yeah. there's no such thing as a good agent. It's only one agent. That's me. That's, That's it. Anthony. It's not, you know. There's no questions asked. You know I'm a seller. Get, get with Anthony for your resale, all you new investors. He's great. But, um, you know, the agent part is so important. And then I can give you guys a few reasons as to why I say that towards the end. Finding the right agent to sell your property, to resell your flip is a big deal. Because if you pick somebody that has great relationships, that's respected in the industry, they can make that deal move a lot faster. Like, for instance, my last flip, my project went from the buyers were first conventional, which I was like, thank God, you know, I had to go through all that red tape. Right. Then switched in the middle of the deal to FHA. But because I had such Dude, a, phones. yeah, because I had such a great agent, he knew the appraiser. He knew, you know, the, the lender. He was able to call, meet them at the house when all the inspections happened and it went through so smooth. Had I had a new agent or somebody who did not have, the connections to make that deal go smooth, you know, that would have cost me money. I would have had to maybe make unnecessary changes to the property because FHA can be a monster when they get involved. Uh, it slowed my deal down, which meant more interest payments each month. Like a hundred, keeping the strategy, making a hundred thousand dollars means you can't lose any money on any phase of the deal. And I'm teaching you the discipline throughout the book to buy at the right price to manage your renovation, to manage your contractors, to manage your materials, to manage your timeline, to manage your budget. And then at the end on the resale, how to pick the right agent and how to get out of the deal if you feel you got the wrong agent, you know, quickly. You got 14 days for me to see something going on. <laughs> I have to be a monster like that because, you know, when you're out here, you're doing so much and you have a bottom line, you can't allow you know, the, the process to kind of work you, you got to work the process. So I really do encourage everybody to come up with their own strategies after doing a lot of research, putting some money together, buckle down. You know, I say that to everybody, even us as investors now, 
if you know that you can triple your money, like if I know that I can at least triple my money no matter what, you give me 10 grand, I can always make it 30 grand. So that means that if I buy something for 10 grand, it really has the value of 30 grand to me. So I right. try to get my purchases like that. Like I use my money as opportunities to make more money, not that I want to have more stuff, that I want to own more stuff, you know, buy more stuff. Like that's not a good idea. But let's go on to one of your next questions. Well, you still didn't give us the mindset part. Oh, the mindset, mindset. Yeah. Okay, I did mention in the beginning to approach everything with a very intentional mindset, right? So you wake up, you're like, all right, I have 168 hours a week. I know how much I need to sleep. I know how much recreation or whatever else, you know, you're doing. And you figure out how many hours of work you can put in because you want to double down. When you're in the process of trying to become an investor and you're trying to generate wealth, this is not the time to try to like chill like you don't have no chill time even if you are like your significant other say hey babe let's watch a movie pull out your your ipad and while y'all watching the movie be doing some <laughs> <fashion> research like <laughs> or, or have a partner or, or your lifestyle a whole lifestyle built around people that understand what mission you're on because again you fortitude as well is another one like that's a word that you need to become <laughs> with. because mental fortitude is the ability to work and operate in pain if you're going to be in real estate why why i gotta why where the pain coming in there what's where the pain coming from? yeah why well, i'm gonna be i mean i know but the pain comes from the day-to-day -day <laughs> operational stuff the process the contractors for sure pain comes a lot of pain a lot of pain comes from contract l and i l and i neighbors oh order Na told us we parked in her we put our tire we parked our truck tires in her yard we messed her yard up from the truck tires listen i have a neighbor story i am still paying a lawyer right now to fight with a neighbor i've sold the house like months ago and she's still mad that my downspout that's on my side of the house is leaking into my breezeway, making it so it's not safe for her to travel in and out of my breezeway. This is this, is this lady. And, the, and I made the mistake because- In the, the house? No, in the front. The front of the breeze, it's the breezeway in the front of the house with the downspout. Yeah. Now, you know, technically a downspout is supposed to be um, to the, ground. In the ground, but this one is not. Okay. But it's on my house. It's in front of my property and it's leaking into my breezeway. So she's but, saying she cause damages or No, she's saying <laughs> she's saying she needs she because it's the breezeway is on my side of the property and she has what she has on her side of the property, but she's all clogged up over there. So she's been comfortable using this breezeway and I don't care. That's the problem. I let the neighbor use the breezeway and then she complained about the downspout when I got under contract and threatened to file a list pendants. So I said, I'll give you whatever you want. At that point, like, you could use right. the business way. You could do whatever you want. To do. Like, just don't file a list pendants about a damn deal. when I'm trying to sell this property. So that's the kind of stuff. Like, at night, when you go home, after, I had to pay, like, freaking $6,000 to fight this lady. Literally, it cost me six grand just to fight an unreasonable. She, she tried to mess with them six, that six, them six figures. That's what she tried. <laughs> she didn't mess with it. She messed with it. <laughs> <laughs> she took my little coins away. But, you know, that's a part of what you say, you know, having that fortitude, right? So you're going through, you did everything right. You got this property. You know, you're ready to sell it. Somebody agrees to buy it. And then you got a neighbor that's trying to stop the deal because mm -hmm. she Add about you know she wants what she wants and they know they have those rights right she even tried to get me to pay for her lawyer like you want me to pay for this unreasonable foolishness <laughs> but that's the fortitude that we're talking about when you get right. into the state you're going to deal with issues like that every single day contractors that come back and say hey guess what remember we told you it's going to cost you ten thousand to do the plumbing it's going to cost you twelve thousand because we can't you know go out from this way. We're going to have to dig in from this way and they got to break right. the scene up and it's going to cost you more. Right. So, so, but if you don't have the money for that, like what if you're not prepared for the extra, you know, money that's going to come about? So you have to have some wiggle room. 
You have to be prepared for things to go wrong. You need to have that emotional intelligence because you can't spaz out. I have gotten so good at hearing bad news. It's just like, it don't even phase me anymore. Like they'll call me and say, oh, lumber price double. Set of defense costs of six grand, it costs 10 grand now. Right. And you're like, okay, I, you know. But that, and because you also, because you're purchasing right, you got enough room for, for, not for error, but for changes. And that's where the importance of one flip away from six figures is because again i talk about this in a book you know people don't aim too high and miss they aim too low and hit like you can go out and say i want to make thirty thousand dollars it's going to take you the same amount of work if you're doing a full gut to make the 30 grand if you just position your numbers differently you buy with a certain margin in mind you know you're going to profit a lot more it is the renovation is going to be just as much of a hassle obviously you know, different renovations come with different requirements, but they're all a lot of work. So if you're going to do the work to get through a renovation, position yourself to make larger margins, larger profit margins, because they're it's, it's just, you know, you have to do that. But how can I say it? Um, I know I kind of got to fill in what you're going to say. What? Go what do you think I'm going to say? I think you're going to say not a lot of people do that. You no, know, no, no. Not about the part, a lot of people, well, so no, a lot of people don't do that. But I want, it's like, I'm pulling on that part of how did you give yourself permission to make that kind of money per se? Because I feel like it's tough for us to wrap our heads around like, yo, I deserve that. I, yeah. Let alone, I could do that. Yeah. So I come from a corporate background and I've been watching millionaires make moves all day, every day. And I already see there's nothing special about them. They're not that much smarter than the average person. And we're idolizing these millionaires and these billionaires. And we want to make our stuff so official. We got to be, you know, too prepared sometimes, you know, just so we can feel like we deserve to make six figures. And that's the other part. And that's the reason why I named my book One Flip Away from Six Figures is because I want you guys to stop, like, idolizing six figures. Six figures is really not a lot of money. <laughs> I don't mean, you know, put it like that because you know, it's just not. Not so they just posted today some girl took her you know that the SBA money spent blew 150 grand in Neiman Marcus or wherever she went. And you like, yo, well, how she blew 150 grand? Because it's 150 grand, 100 grand is really not much. Like once you start moving the exactly shit. Exactly how you got you know them Birkin bags is like fifty thousand. <laughs> they bought two Birkin bags and air boots and that's it. <laughs> I'll be damned if I wear a whole house. Mm. It's a long time and it's crazy because and this is a shout out to all you fashionistas you know it's really crazy how you know we have the love for style and fashion and all this other stuff but we forget that like you know once you spend that money it's gone make sure you're in position first right so when they say champagne taste and beer money like that is a new <laughs> term now that you got to think about because can you really afford it if right. you Forty, fifty thousand dollar assets coming in profit every month. Buy a Birkin, because you got assets paying for your liability. Next month, maybe you won't buy anything. You know, what, you if, do the Bur what if I just want the Burberry jacket? I can't get the Burberry jacket. No, not until you prove to yourself you can afford it. Ooh. Start holding your own self accountable. Like I don't even. If I could put turn down retail, any single person, we got all these people on lock, you guys can turn down retail. I'm telling you, because I I get like if I have a sale and hundred fifty thousand dollars is wired into my account, I'm not even looking at that money until I got a deal coming through where I know I need to spend money or I'm considering stocks or something else. But you know, buying things what what did Malik always say? Stop buying shit. <laughs> That's his number one. Anybody, like, if I have him on Clubhouse speaking, I'm like, Lee, give the people some advice. At the end of the, uh, you know, we'll be wrapping it up. He was like, he'll tell people, stop buying shit. That's you tell yourself, I can't afford it. Because if you spend $40, you know, let's just say you only do it. Let's say you spend $40 on dinner 10 times a month, which is not hard. 10 times a month. That's four or five. That's $400 that you can be putting towards your saving initiative so that you can get into a situation that you can put, if you put 10,000 down and you get a $50,000 property and you can make money, you know, profit, which is kind of what I did. You remember my deal? I put down like 10 grand. Right. 
thousand dollar property. That's all I put down. It was like ten or eleven thousand dollars. That's right. all the money you need. If you put down eleven thousand dollars and buy a sixty thousand dollar property, depending on how you borrow the money, whether it's gonna be that ten thousand dollars could literally turn into fifty. That's what I did. Like I turned my ten into fifty, you know, because I took the ten. Put the other, you know, the lender's money with my money, did the renovation, got in and out of it in four months. In four months, my ten thousand had turned into fifty thousand dollars. Right. You waste ten thousand dollars, you know, in six months or even you know what I mean? Like I can't really right. set numbers wise, but if you're wasting money, you're slow you're slowing down your potential to wealth. Right. And your in progress. In the first five to ten years, when you get really serious about generating wealth. You have to be very intentional about your spending and make sure that your money is being used, you know, to grow, to multiply. Right. So I think what Grant Cardone says, um, how to get money, how to keep money, how to multiply money. Right. Those are the those are the steps that you have to master. How can you generate money? How can you keep save the money to get to where you you know want to go investing wise? And how and what vehicle are you going to use to multiply your money? That's a question that you should be asking yourself daily somebody just asked can you still buy properties in philly you think philly's still a good market of course of course there's still deals in philly there's still deals everywhere i recommend if you live in philly and you're a first-time investor buy in philly Philly will not recommend new investors to do out-of-state investing so if you live in philly you 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 have to do get some off-market deals so you okay you still invest in philly is by having a team and one of the people on your team is anthony you know wholesaling his friends are wholesalers so they all know each other these guys know what properties is on the streets because <laughs> home doing other things and they're seeing these deals come through in large amounts like i'm on a lot of wholesalers emails like almost 10 i get 10 emails every day where i'm analyzing deals right all day every day i right. see the deals I see, I see good deals. And I'm going to tell you a six figure, the numbers on a six figure deal. You buy the property for $65,000 with the ARV, 380,000. That happened to me. I bought a property. This property was on the market for $40,000. Once I ran the comps and I saw the ARV was 374, this <laughs> auction, it was this is a crazy story. My stories is all crazy, but it was an auction. Can I tell you guys how I paid $25,000 above asking just to acquire their property? So I spent $65,000 for a $40,000 property because I saw the ARV was three seventy four. Right. And I bought it, renovated it, and put it on the market for three eighty nine. dollars mm. like Numbers on that, something you bought for $64,000. Cause I'm risky and I'm, you know, I do what I do in terms of the finishes. I put in $120,000 on the renovation side. That ain't no lipstick on a pig. No, no. That's, I might as well tore the whole roof off, tore the whole thing down. <laughs> I might as well had to build that thing. By the time I was done, I had surround sound, LED mirrors that don't fog up, smart everything. I mean, <laughs> smart doors and, the, even the thing I even did scent marketing in this house. Like when you walk in the door, it just smell like I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that feeling you want, and that's why, like you said, your, your property sells in the first couple of days. It's those little things that people say, "Oh, that this the one, this the one." And that's what we have to understand when you're renovating or building houses. You got to remember that real estate is one of the only things that when you're selling it to a buyer, they're allowed to talk about how your property makes them feel. Right. So when they come in the door, they're like, this just doesn't feel right. Or right. It feels like home. So that's my company absolutely specializes in making a house a home. What's the name that's of your company for those that want, to, that want to use your services? Yeah, so it's Impact. So the investment is two different sides of the business, Impact Investment and Design Firm. So the design firm is where we specialize in making a house a home, whether it's via staging or, you know, the interior design or, you know, investors that turn their properties over to me um, at drywall. Like I have investors who will get their properties to the drywall phase and then myself and my team will go into that property and then put in all these like really cool finishes and state of the art um, 
features into the build or the renovation project and it makes it much more attractive to the buyers because we have data now we know exactly what buyers are looking for they're looking for energy efficient options they're looking for smart home options like if you look at even what the stock market is doing by way of these semiconductors and the artificial intelligence and all this digital stuff that stuff has to be trickling down into real estate as well if you're a builder or a developer how to make position yourself in front of a paradigm is to make sure that you're studying the patterns of buyers and you're implementing those things into your renovations that's how you sell your properties quick you know so that's a whole big thing on the are we, are we using are we using um the gray base cabinets and the white tops or are we using the blue we throwing the blue on the island yeah, you're doing something to make your project swanky. You know, what, what the guys call it, feng shui. You got to put some <laughs> feng shui. <laughs> like, just don't put white cabinets and cheap countertops and, and try to get, you just, you miss the opportunity when you, like, yeah. white on, No white on white. I'm, I look, I'm trying to, I'm trying to steal, steal a consultation on the live from my foot. <laughs> you said, see, I already bought the white cabinets. What can I do to spruce them up? <laughs> <laughs> you do some cabinet pulls, some backsplash, go on Amazon and get a $50 gold faucet that look like you. Yeah, I, see, I'm, I'm kind of anti the gold faucet. I don't. That's I don't, this big deal. I, the gold just, I'd rather do black before I do gold. Like, I, You think gold is subjective? Like some people won't like it and it'll make your property more like slated for one person? Right, right. No, it's a design trend. It's a design trend that is really... And the gold cool. handles, too. The gold faucet and the gold handles. Yeah. You got to think. A lot of times, HGTV <laughs> will set a lot of trends. Okay. Like, they had these buyers out here looking for stuff that was featured on HGTV. And right now, brass is the biggest deal out there in terms of metals. But I get why you don't do it. Because you're not a designer and you don't know how to do it right. So if you can't just throw a gold... I got, I got Taste? What you talking about? I got some taste. <laughs> no, you got to make that thing look good. You got to put the gold faucet, the gold cabinet pulls. You want to make sure your door hinges are gold. Right. No, but so that's what I'm saying. Like, I kind of, so you had, you got the wine without me. Why, why you didn't, why you didn't get me, get, like, yo, and make sure you got your wine. See? We talked about that. Who lives with that? <laughs> Look, a glass a day keep keep the pain away. Glass a day. The fortitude. So wait, let's get let's talk. Let's go back to mental fortitude. You wanted to talk about mindset. Go ahead. And having the the, the mental fortitude, right? This is going to carry over in your investment life as well as in your personal life. So when all of this crazy stuff is happening in your personal life and things aren't going right. Your phone tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. is still going to be ringing. Contractors and drama. How do you operate when you're in pain, when you lost a loved one, when your children aren't, you know, you know, oper uh, performing the way you want them to? How do you get back into that vehicle that is so very demanding? And I think the higher you grow, the less demanding, you know, it becomes as an investor. But that first couple five years I would say like for me boots on the ground like I literally have been working like 90 some plus hours a week every week for the past three years and some days I don't feel like it and some days I don't feel good and some days I got bad things happening in my world but we still have to show up so having the, the fortitude is going to be a really big deal so just take that away from um this live not that you know we want to give you guys some solid fundamentals to build wealth but mm -hmm. Mindset is big, too, because you have to show up even on days that you don't feel good or you don't feel like it or bad things happened yesterday. Like, it's been so many days that I leave a job site completely defeated. Like, it's so much going on, things that I can't control, days where you feel like your best just isn't enough. So you're your best. Like, I've really given this project my best or I, I don't know what more to do. And then you just have to come back the next day. Just your presence alone helps to solve a lot of these real estate problems. Getting involved, being proactive, learning strategies, having a network, having that social currency where you can call, say, hey, aunt, look, um, I had a party here on Sunday, the siding is falling <laughs> down. Do you have a siding guy? 
Right. Anthony, your sighting guy ain't show up. Can you call him? <laughs> now, I was so, I, and what you were saying, I literally was thinking team because, like, like what you just said about, like, yo, stuff going wrong and all that. And I'm like, yo, I honestly, like, so far, this, like, I told you some of my other horror stories where, you know, I had a contract to burn me for 20 grand. So, like, now my, now my contract is situa situation with the team. We good. So honestly, I really don't get the phone calls no more with the headaches. Like the now, and he knows, like I gave him range, like if it's a problem, handle it. That's why, that's why he gets paid the big money because he's supposed to handle it. Don't bring it to me until you solve it. You solve it, then bring it to me. I can't tell you guys enough how important it is to have the right contractors. Like having the wrong contractors will destroy your entire livelihood. Because <laughs> if they do something wrong and you get sued and you don't have the proper safeguards in place to cover your behind, right. you're done. I mean, and just the feeling of selling a person a home and you're not 100% confident in what's going on behind the walls, that, that drives me nuts. I know for a fact that in five years, I want to drive through Philadelphia and see families enjoying things that I built. Right. Because I know that it's quality, because I know that it's sustainable. You know, even with my designing, I wanna use classic designs that they don't feel like they need to upgrade into years. Even if I use brass or gold or whatever is semi-trendy, I still wanna give them classic designs that- You was reading my mind? That's what I was, you was reading my mind about that gold? You was reading my mind. Live a little. <laughs> Gold is going to be in style in 10 years. So, no, but, you know, the contractor piece, we don't spend enough time talking about vetting contractors. The way, here's my strategy on getting good contractors. And I know, Anthony, you probably have a good team that you just continue to use from job to job. But I can't always do that. And I'll tell you why it's harder for me to find a good contractor is because I'm a designer. And I'm asking them to do really radical stuff. So it's not just come in and we're going to break, break, them, break them out their mold. I know what you mean. Yes. Yeah, a lot of them like, I don't do that. I don't do that. No. <laughs> I never use less than three different types of tile in the bathroom. Never. I could do anywhere from three to five different styles of tile in the bathroom. They don't want to deal with that. They could work with somebody else. They're going to use one type of tile in the bathroom and that's that. They don't um, do for, the, for the floor. Keep it They moving. don't have to worry about hexagon and picket and all these. <laughs> styles they don't care but um when i first started pulling together contractors i drove around like i drove around to job sites and luckily for us there's so much going on by way of development in philadelphia mm -hmm. that you can literally drive around and find contractors so that was the best way for me to do it because in my book i talk about this you basically show up on monday you could show up on wednesday you could show up on friday you could keep coming back to see their continuity <laughs> you know if you're there it's like all right i met this contractor he said he's working on this property i can keep popping up to see if he's there i can ask the person that he's working for is he reliable i can take a look at his work right then and there i can see how he's interacting with other trades and kind of get a feel for his work and then you know use that information to go another step in a vetting process these contractors have so much of your money um tied into what they do or don't do like you're not building a house you're not renovating a, a house so when you when you are doing fix and flip anything whether it's for a rental or for a flip project the contractors hold so much power because if they don't finish it, it's costing you money. If they finish it incorrectly, it's costing you costing money. You money. Paying to have stuff <laughs> done, costing you money. If they overcharge you, it's costing you money. Right. If they, like, I mean, you have to have good contractors. You got to call your friends. Hey, who do you have? Because I don't just use somebody for the first time and I don't know anything about them. I don't. I only use referrals and people that I'm out in the field recruiting on my own. That's it referrals and people that I recruit you, in the field. You treat them like tenants. You're doing a screening and a criminal background. Both. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> and that's because, I mean, you put, like, you put, I do full gut, so mine is never any less than $80,000. So I, you know, I, mean, I, I had an old head tell me, he said, man, this house, 
He said, you put this thing together for 40000 I said, sloppy floors, metal cabinets in the kitchen. What? I can't share the kitchen at that forty. I, I said, yo, that was like maybe in the early, the, the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s, 40000 Yeah. I, I can't do mechanical damn near for 40000 yeah. So back to the question, I still think that Philly is a great place to invest, but you just have to be tactical about how you're analyzing deals. Are you doing um off market deal sourcing on your own? Are you close friends with somebody who's doing off market deal sourcing? Are you close friends with a realtor who sees what's coming on the MLS and shoots you out? you know, properties based on your buying strategy. So yes, this is a great time to still continue to um, invest in Philadelphia. There's money to be made here for sure. Especially if you live here, it makes it more convenient for you to renovate in the city that you reside in. Somebody asked, would you recommend buying lots and land? Um, if you want to answer that first, or you want me to answer? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Especially if you buy land in an opportunity zone, if you have the stomach for it, you got to know what you're doing. This isn't, don't buy land if you're a new investor and have no experience with underwriting and, you know, the real estate world and how things work. So in the beginning, no. But once you are in real estate, you know exactly what's happening. Like we're doing it so much, you have no choice but to learn what's going on, right? You can take land in Philadelphia that are in opportunity zones and develop them into these like multi-million dollar communities. You can right. Im implement whatever the neighborhood is lacking, whether it's senior housing, whether it's affordable groceries, when you want to use the commercial space at the bottom to bring in, you know, healthy groceries into these underprivileged neighborhoods. So I think personally, when it comes down to buying land, figure out ways to maximize like a buddy of mine initially bought a piece of land and she, her first thought was to put two condos on there which was two units a piece so four condos because she was in the opportunity zone now she's doing senior living where she's doing like 50 units and she was approved for the zoning for all of that so and she'll get a crazy tax credit and in, in, in a tax break she'll get that Credits. The neighbors are super excited about the new, op the new, you know, opportunity, the new resource that's going to be there, right? So if you're providing resource to those that are living in the community, whether you're creating jobs, whether you're providing education, like opportunity zones and bringing in things that the neighborhoods are lacking is a cash cow. It's Not, a cash cow. Right. It's just a little more tedious in regards to like. I Yes. Part, would you say it again? I'm sorry. You said say it again. You said a lot more. Yeah. A yeah. lot. That's yeah. all. You said if you could learn that, like, yo, that's a skill set within itself. So I had the opportunity not too long ago to sit on the meeting of people with doing opportunity zone, like, and just like I said, the tax credits alone was crazy. So you talk about the ten year tax abatement, and then with the opportunity zone, not to have to pay federal taxes on the income that you're making on those buildings, not to mention. I think, um, I forget who it's called. I think it's the PIDC. Don't ask me what, it, what it's called, but I think it's the PIDC. Something where they'll also give you funding toward your build because you're building in the Opportunity Zone. Yeah. But yeah. it's getting through, the, getting through the door. That's the hard part with it. That's what we like about real estate. Whatever it is you're passionate about, you can find a way to align what you enjoy doing with some stage of the real estate process, whether you want to be a wholesaler, whether you want to be an agent, a lender, a builder. For me, I found my lane in design. I've always had a really, you know, a eye for style and fashion. So applying it to home development was perfect for me. So now I figured out a way to love what I do. So I do it, you know, to generate wealth and to build sustainable income and assets for me and my children's children, blah, blah, blah. But I also get to enjoy my life by actually doing something that's fulfilling for me. So we want to make sure that you guys um, remember that part, right? So remember that piece. While you're building wealth, you're responsible for still living a good life. And one of the ways to live a good life is to do things that you enjoy, you know, your way of making money should be something that you actually enjoy doing every day. <laughs> Finding your niche in that process of building the wealth and being happy and being fulfilled in the process is something I recommend. Cause I know Anthony, you do so many different things 
um, in real estate. You're an agent and an investor. You got some wholesaling stuff going on and all these things. What part about it do you love the most? So it is the flipping because just seeing the family's reaction and they're, they're like, I got actually I got the two houses I did. Those families that had more children, and now like seeing them with those houses is like, oh, like y'all really in my house? Well, it's not my house no more, but you know, it's still my house. You know, it's my yeah. baby. Like, like yo, y'all living life and doing good. Yeah, and you're a family guy, so that's what does it for you. You, know, you being able to see these children. Hey, little guy, look at that. Say hi. Huh? He's like, I don't want to actually be a part of the live. I'm just going to hang out, and make myself present. <laughs> He just want my phone. That's all he want. <laughs> but that, and I'll say, like, again, I've learned, like, I've been able to focus in and make more money as I'm doing less now. So, like, I do do a lot of things, but I'm not actually doing all those things anymore. So I'm more so, I'd rather make half of something than all of everything. Yeah. By working with people. So, again, that makes my day a lot less crazier because I'm leveraging people and relationships to get my goals done. But yeah. even if Parts to the land part. Somebody asked earlier about the again about the land. Go, go, go on, give me. I gotta get him in the back. One second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take your time. No, you're good. So yeah. I can try to like fill in a little bit while Anthony is gone um, and talk more about. All right, so we went through all right mindset, strategy, execution. can't take any of this stuff personal so that's the mindset part the strategy part is what is unique to what you have going on financially and what are you able to do in terms of like how work with what you have if you don't have any money how can you get to 10 grand how fast can you get to 10 grand if you have 10 grand how fast can you get to 100 grand so those strategies that are personal to who you are where you are in life being honest about your personal um, where you are personally and what you need to do you always can if you don't have the time then you pretty much may have the money you can pay somebody to do things that you don't have the time to do if you don't have the money but you have the time then you can do a lot of that stuff yourself whether it's sourcing deals marketing your product your because you don't have the money to pay people but you do have the time so that's the strategy part and then the execution is once you have the right mindset and you have the, the right strategy that works for you after hearing what everybody has to say we all have a story we all have something to offer we're all doing this every day all day um i, I don't know if anthony got more questions but i feel like we want to be specific to what you guys want to know from us somebody, somebody just asked karan how do you recommend a first time person like well you told us already about the steps to save up but well, well, how's the question worded so how much would you recommend a first time investor save up i put together 50 grand it took me an entire year i don't think you should rush being a first, you you know during that time while you're putting money together as a new investor you're supposed to be researching you're supposed to be volunteering with other investors. You're supposed to be staying as close to what you want to do as possible so that you can become an expert before you pull the trigger. You want to already be an expert, and that's going to involve a lot of reading. That's going to involve you taking some of these classes, you know, finding out who's doing really good classes and taking them, investing in your education. Um, and as far as the money part is concerned, it's going to be um, once you've done the research, then you're start, you'll start putting together a strategy. This is what I want to do. I want to get a duplex. Say you want a house hack. House hacking is when you take a FHA loan, um, you put the three point five percent down. You get two units. Let's just say, for the sake of this example, you get a two unit multifamily. You live in one and you rent out the other one. <clears throat> for something like that, I think that you can probably you know ten to fifteen thousand dollars where. In that, in that um, building, you then can work on your next plan. You do that for a year because FHA only requires you to reside in the property for a year. Um, after that, you have to figure out what your next plan is going to be. So you got a whole year to put some more money together. So again, it's all about that process. It's all about that discipline and that steady process. So you take the first minimum, I would say you need 15 grand, I would just say, because... 
Um, depending on if you buy something that needs renovations, you have to be able to close on that first property and you have to be able to finance that first draw work because the banks or lenders, whether it's conventional FHA or hard money, they typically pay for progress. So once the first draw of construct construction is done, then they'll give you your money back. So meaning that that money has to come out of your pocket. That's, that's, you know, if it's an $80,000 full gut, you got to put up another 20, 25,000. So now you need 15,000 to close and 25,000 for the first phase of work. That's $40,000. That's what it looked like when I went into my first project. I needed ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000 to close. I actually ended up buying two properties within like the same month because I pulled the fast one on Anthony. <laughs> But um, I still had to pay out that first draw of construction out of my pocket. Right. You know, the loan oh. caught up. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the loan. Loan, the loan will catch up and you will be reimbursed. But depending on what your strategy is, whether you're going to do fix or flip, whether you're going to do a house hacking project or whether you're going to do a rental and a bird strategy, um, that is very specific to how much money you're going to need as a new investor. I wouldn't say start doing anything with less than 15 grand. Once you got 15 grand, you can look for a property. Depending on how much work that property is going to need and who's paying for the construction, you may need to finance the first draw of work. So you need to have that money as well. I was going to say in regards to like just trying to figure it out and put the plays together, um, something key that you said was provide value. So when you said invest but when you talk about providing value ask yourself what can i do to help someone else that by me helping them in return i can help myself so what it looked like for me before i even got started doing any of my real estate stuff i remember i was going to people properties and helping them clean it out just so i could be in the mix and i'm not talking about i was doing demo like i literally had the broom trash can just keeping a clean job site but while i'm there i'm looking and seeing Oh, the electrician do this, the plumber do this. And then now when I speak to the owner, you know what he say? He just start talking and giving me game about what's going on. But now that, like you said, you're in that environment, oh, it, I just start, it start clicking over uh, eventually. But it is there all the time. It's all about adding value. Like I get dozens of DMs every day. I mean, at least. 15, 20, 30, if I do one of these lives or if I do a clubhouse, I can get hundreds of DMs. And, you know, I can't get to all of them. And when I do, everyone's saying, you know, can you mentor me? Can you mentor me? Can you show me how you're doing what you do? And I don't really have the time to stop. I'm still on the grind. You know, I'm still a learner. Right. I'm still a student. I want to be a student to the next level. I'm a forever learner. So if I, the ones, the people that really get my attention are the ones that say, can I volunteer in your staging business and learn the process? Like you said, adding value. I, all, I had to pay my dues for the whole first year when I was getting in position and I was researching and put my money together. I volunteered for a who was doing, a, doing good work. Like you got to find somebody who's doing what you enjoy and doing it well. And then you got to be around this person and around what they do as much as possible. And the way they're going to let you be around them is by adding value some kind of way. Everybody has the ability to add value. You just got to figure it out. And the whole point of this whole conversation is, are you savvy enough to figure it out? Because there has been many times where it felt like a brick wall or it felt like I didn't have or I didn't know or I wasn't prepared or I didn't. Right you know, wasn't put in a position to do this, to be an investor. I don't know anybody. I don't know any contractors. I don't have any friends that are realtors or blah, blah, blah. But it's about how savvy are you going to be to put yourself in position? Are you getting on Clubhouse and meeting people that are trying to do what you want to do? Are you joining these lives? Are you talking to people? Are you following up? Are you just saying, look, I'm in your DMs just to say hi. You know, I, I, I see what you're doing. I like what you're doing. If I could figure out a way to help and add value to you, I just want to be around. Because being around people that are doing what you want to do and making a lot of money doing that are going to be your best tool in terms of you getting the experience because it's a field, right? It's an industry and there's so many moving parts. The more you're around to it, the more you know, you're equipped with information when things are happening. You're like, oh, shit, I remember when I was doing my internship 
you know, the first year. And I remember that happened, you know, right. call that person and say, hey, this is happening to me. You know, do you have any advice? You know, or you're there sweeping with your broom and trash can. <laughs> the owner has people coming in and everybody. Uh-oh, did we lose you? Did I lose y'all or did you lose or did we lose you, Karan? Uh-oh, Karan, you there? All right, so she might have jumped out, but I believe Karan's going to try to jump back in. Uh, are we? Hey, hey, Molly, shoot me a DM too. I want to find out what deals you got. I appreciate you dropping in here, letting us know that you got some wholesale deals. But like Karan said, I, I need them six figure deals. So send me something that's six figures. I don't know her her, her Wi Fi or something might have dropped, but she I'm sure she's gonna try to jump back in. I'm sure she's gonna try to jump back in. But with that, but with that said, again. Make sure y'all add value and y'all start connecting with people so that, you know, you guys can also learn, but also be a resource. Don't just be somebody that's just stealing information so that you can make sure that you and your family eat. It's one thing to be able to, to you know, get in a room and do things. It's another thing when you get in a room and you make sure the people that you're at the table with, they're also eating as well as you're eating. That's when you really start changing, changing your trajectory and changing people's lives. Um, Ugo, I'm with you. Ugo, definitely need something like that. But if y'all don't got no other questions, you already know next Thursday we will be back here doing another live every Thursday at 8 p.m. I definitely appreciate appreciate y'all working with me tonight with the technical difficulties we had. Um, I don't know. Go ahead. If you got a question, drop it down. Drop it down. Forever hold your peace. Yo, we'll definitely talk. We'll definitely talk. Uh, we we all need deals. So we all need deals. But I definitely got some stuff in the works. I definitely got some stuff in the works. Um, try to keep connecting with some more wholesalers and we'll make it happen. Go ahead. Karan just came back in. So we're just going to give her a second to jump in and close this thing. The technical issues tonight is like nuts. But that's that fortitude you said. It's, it be trying you. You just got to keep pushing, guys. Like, <laughs> if stuff happens, keep pushing. But go ahead. What with some of the questions I'm seeing? How many bird deals can you do without over leveraging? So that's like the answer there because I don't like the bird strategy because I just don't want to over leverage. That's more like a personal question. So, it's, and again, you got to know what your goal is. So, one thing I just told my class that I had this last weekend we can't tell you what areas to buy in, right? Because what's going to help you tell the areas that you buy in, you got to know the clientele you want. But in addition to knowing the clientele you want, you got to know what your goal is. So, if you got a goal and you want to buy rentals, you want to be in areas that are, you know, cash flowing super heavy and appreciating or you just strictly want the cash flow so i know for me i'm trying to get at least four to five hundred off of all my rentals that I'm, I'm i'm looking to buy moving on so it's like i know i can't be buying two bedroom houses in areas that the houses is only worth 30 40 thousand it's just not gonna work yeah I need, to be, I need to be in areas where you know people can afford to pay for a two or for a three bedroom or two bedroom you know twelve hundred dollars and up so again, you know, you got to figure out how it is that you'll reach your goal. So for some people, like one of my other homies, my and mentors, he's for every, I think for every three houses he has, he only has one mortgage. So he's like, I don't mind burn because I'll, I'll refile one house and buy two more houses straight cash. And you know what? Somebody at the bottom of the page just said, what strategy do you use in place of the burn? That is ex what what is your process when choosing your design? We got to remember some of these questions. They got good questions now. So listen, the strategies that we use in place of the burr is just not refinancing. Like I don't refinance my projects because I don't want high mortgages because I want free and clear properties. 
So and I'm other, just buying rentals. I'm just not refining all of them. Right, but so the, that's the key, though. So I think they're missing that part of you take the money from. A, say you do one flip, you make six figures. You now go buy another. Justin, rent. <laughs> go ahead. There go Je Jess right there. There go Jess. I know. I see him. I just said the big homie. I just was talking about you. So <laughs> what you do, you buy, do the flip, then go buy a rental free and clear. You know, and you just do a balance check. So for you, you might not, Karan might not need 30 houses because she got 10 or 15 of them with no mortgages. Exactly. So we and that's, Anthony just said a key point, guys. <laughs> I have seen people with 40 doors not make no money. Somebody with 10 doors could be making more than somebody with 40 doors because they're over leveraged. So it's really not about what do you use in place of the burr. It's how do you, what's your burr? What's so, your burr? I just I, don't refinance. <laughs> because would, my goal is to get the hell out of these rentals and I have to pay them off. So I don't so, want my mortgage to go up. So I wouldn't say everybody's over leveraged with it as much as right, I was. Right. right. You got to really know your risk tolerance. So, but like you said, you don't want those houses to always have a mortgage because you're going to constantly have to be working to pay them. So again, you know, you got to figure out what works for you. But in the beginning, I do feel like if you're not flipping the burst strategy is what will help you get there so that you can have free and clear houses. But again, the key is in between, just be very careful because you're pulling, basically when you refinance, your mortgage can go up. You know, if it's not the right time and somehow you got equity and blah, 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 you have to be very, very, I'm, I preach being very careful with the bird. Like a lot of people is, if you know how to do it and you're okay with the leverage and blah, 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 that's cool. But because my strategy is six figures per, excuse me, six figures per flip, then I use that money to buy my properties. You know what I mean? So that I don't have to do all the refinancing and have these high mortgages. I am petrified of being over leveraged. But, having but a the, like you, said, you, you know you, you know your risk tolerance. Right. But I think that's right. the... That's that's really the key, and also you got to figure out your goal because some of y'all 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 will get the six figure flips. Some of y'all might not get the six figure flips. Right. So you got to figure out what works for you in the combination. And I tell people, yo, it's only but so many hours of a day. So you got to work your job, do your business, and try to accomplish all these things. Again, you got to figure out what's going to be the best route to get you there and get you there in the time frame that works for you, not that works for instagram or for what worked for somebody else find out what works for you and just do that keep your head down until you get there at the end of the day um uh, but again corral we appreciate you we're not going you know hold you all night answer this one question that i saw come up a lot of questions came through but this one i want to answer someone asked how do i go about picking finishes which is all right are you the gc for all your projects most of them but um as far as uh, how do I go about picking finishes? One, I am an absolute interior designer. And what I mean is I am studying high-end toilets at three in the morning while y'all sleep. <laughs> I am literally, I know all the design trends. I know what's happening. I know what's hot. I know what tile. I know how to run the tile. I know how to pick the floor in. So basically I put myself in position because I'm so interested an interior design and packing my builds and my renovations with lots and lots of cool features. I'm seeking that information. Anything that you want to be good at, you have to put yourself in the position to have the information be attracted to you. I'm on blogs. I'm on mailing list. I follow all the high end designers that are doing million dollar builds all over the world, different countries. I'm studying, t you know, tile from Spain. I'm studying, you know, light switches that are happening over in Europe before it comes here. I'm in front of the trends. So like those that like finishes is more than just finishes for me. It's about adding in cool features to make these builds unique, to make them more desirable. And also I do that on every level of the budget. So I can go in Home Depot and pick you out some designer shit. <laughs> Whereas most design, most investors they stay going in there to get a subway tile white subway tile stop doing it guys no yo, more white them, subway tile. Uh, yo yo what's wrong with the ain't nothing wrong with subway tile it's nothing wrong with subway tile because you know why 
people won't leave it alone so they keep recreating it <laughs> and now if you have to buy subway tile let me give you a hack about cheap tile flip it the other direction don't do horizontal do vertical like you know run it a different direction you know put or three pieces Aaron bone i think it's called Aaron, chevron you know do you yeah, know I, I design i might not mess with the gold but i got a little design you see? just because you said hair and bone don't mean you get to pull your hoodie up <laughs> <laughs> this man no one tile pattern he's talking about hair and bone 500 <laughs> alex no but you know it's really about being intentional and if you don't know how to design a property and you don't have any women in your life that can help you hire a designer like, I make my clients so much money. I started out, I think I charged like $3,500 when I first started, you know, in terms of like picking finishes and designing the bill after drywall. If I charge you $3,500 and you can sell this property for $10,000 more or you get into a buyer frenzy, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. Not only, even if you don't increase the property value, but your property sells faster because it's um, visually pleasing, aesthetically pleasing. You got, you can't skip the design. So much money is made in the design phase, even come when it comes down to short-term rentals. I've been designing Airbnbs left and right because the short-term rental space is blowing up. And right. what do people use to decide whether or not they're gonna invest in or they're gonna stay in your Airbnb? Pictures, they use pictures. <laughs> Where do you think they get the pictures from? <laughs> they take pictures of good projects. You have to, I, on my page, if you guys look at Chronicle, I know I'm on my um, impact page right now because I couldn't get on. I got to find out what the hell is going on with my Instagram. But I posted designer projects left and right. I'm designing like nine bathrooms right now as we speak. None of them are mine. So they're all for other people, other investors. Actually, you know, somebody has a duplex. Four of the bathrooms is his. I'm doing a single family. Two of his. And then I have even residential clients where I'm remodeling their bathrooms and kitchens and doing all that kind of stuff now. So it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's what, if you get a professional, it's what they do all day, every day. It's a lot of designers in Philadelphia. They don't charge a whole, whole lot of money, especially if you're an investor. They already know you're not going to pay a lot. <laughs> but you get somebody to come in and you get a professional. Hire a professional to make sure because all the work that you're spending money on to do behind the walls is all cool and it needs to be done properly. Believe me, quality work. But that is not what people see. And that is not what people use to make a decision on whether or not they're going to rent your space, whether or not they're going to buy your home, whether or not they're going to stay at your Airbnb. It's all visual. So you want to make sure that your visual, your design, your finishes, it's cohesive. It goes together. You're not just throwing anything together. It looks nice. It's professional. And you get, you know, you, that, that way you set your, it's like buying high-end countertops. Why would you spend thousands of dollars on expensive countertops but miss, you know, the step of making sure that your property is comfortably functional and designed properly? You can't skip what people are going to see and what they're going to use to decide if they want to align with your property by way of purchase, rent, or whatever it's going to be. Staying in your space for a short-term rental, you have to be sure that it's, vis it's aesthetically pleasing. Qu I got money on the table. I got a design question for you. Go. So, it, ex exposed brick or doing um, like the wallpaper? Wallpaper, if I had to say. Exposed brick is so yesterday. Like that trend is overdone. We're sick of it. That's what the subway tile, we, we, we off that. I mean, here's the thing. It's very subjective because every designer is going to have their thing, what they like, what they don't like. I don't like exposed brick. I think it gives it a rustic vibe. It's rugged. It's, it's not luxury to me. It's more, you know, I don't know, in that whole rustic world, restoration, someone's angry. I think they like exposed brick. But if you <laughs> like it, hey, utilize it. But I just don't love it. I think okay. in a basement, yeah, maybe, to add character. In right. a place where it's not normally any character, so I would do it in the basement. Like a dot, dot house? Like for an accent wall. 
wallpaper is the come is about to be a real big deal again. So I like wallpaper in the vestibule or in like the half bathroom. No, I'm thinking wallpaper now is in lieu of like your headboard and your master suite. So you can, you know, accent your master bathroom with your bedroom with mm -hmm. wallpaper in there. Wallpaper has become very, very radical. Wallpaper I, the Trey Sillings? Possibly. I love Crawford and Trey Sillings, guys. Someone said I don't expose the brick either. It's just, mm, now you talk about something that's subjective. What if a buyer comes through and they don't like exposed brick? You're limiting your buyer pool with that. Right. Drop all that wall. Drywall it. Like, I don't think... Oh, don't take the whole house up with the brick. I don't like it. I, you can, See, that's a question. You can put five designers up and they'll it's all... Something different. Different. That's a but very that's, subjective... That's it's a big, thing for you. In my opinion, as it relates to Karan Nicole, I don't like exposed brick. I don't... Because I, I'm, <laughs> I'm very contemporary. I'm a contemporary designer, meaning that I'm studying million-dollar bills. Do you see exposed brick in million-dollar bills? No. <laughs> Next I'm, question. <laughs> no, I'm thinking because... You see it in the city. You don't see it, those million-dollar homes. Like Brewery Town, Fish Town, you see the exposed brick. Not in a million-dollar, those new, do you see the new construction? No, you don't right. see it. It's a restoration element. It's in, like, Philly Revival. You know, when you start restoring old Philly charm, I'm not into that. I'm into taking a property fast forward. It might be 100 years old in the foundation, but the inside of it, is very modern I and i'm modernizing everything so, <laughs> and no i don't mm -mm. what's your uh, next question though so you uh, no so literally i said we good um do you have when is your book coming out where can we so, find it? yeah so if we're follow everybody let's follow each other be sure that we're connected and the only reason i say that is because my strategy to investing might be something that you connect with um, I'm also, you know, a designer. So all of my projects are swanky and it's entertaining and I post everything, everything. I'm going to tell, about... tell them it's swanky when they come in here because normally I tell them my, my flips be sexy. That's how I always want mine to be sexy. And I got to tell them it's, it's swanky. It's swanky. I do very swanky builds. But on my stories, I talk about life when you're balancing being an investor, you're balancing being a mom, you're balancing being a woman. You know, I'm a 36-year-old woman still, you know, and I have the same feeling that everybody else has day-to-day um, -day and emotions and, and, you know, that whole thing. So it's a lifestyle. So when you connect uh, and post, can you post the page? Because I got some people asking. But um, the Quran page or? My it's a lifestyle. It's a journey. So if you can align with, 10 to 15 people who are really making money and you watch how they move like most people i'm gonna give you a little cheat sheet all of us we all come into these lives with hoodies on it's a reason for that because we don't want to spend no money on clothes <laughs> we don't want to think about what we have on we just want to get dressed and be clean and spend every extra day dollar minute whatever on our plan, on our strategy, making it actually work, right? So right. the reason that it's good to follow people that are actually doing it is because you'll get to see. you get to see when I'm frustrated. I tell people this on Clubhouse all the time. Stay connected every day because then you get to see people can talk a good game. Like, oh, yeah, I'm making six figures from a flip. It's easy. You know, it's a good, great lifestyle, blah, 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 blah. But then when you see me flipping out on Tuesday on my stories <laughs> because the contractor tried to burn me, then you get a real experience on, you know, kind of how the game works and my approach and pair that with other, what other people are saying. Don't always just go by what I say and what I'm doing, how I'm doing it. Let me be one benchmark that you guys use in your investment um, journey. Because I started out just like you, a beginner, getting information, volunteering, saving. And I'm still, I took time away from being a teacher like I was an instructor for a couple months I was on everybody's paid class like people are now doing a lot of webinars and they're doing a lot of zooms on how to flip a property and they were paying me 
to come in and tell my story, you know, whether it's how I became an investor, how I'm making six figures from a bill, design to sell. How do you design a property where you can maximize and make 10 extra thousand or whatever the case may be? I was doing that for a long time. I was doing clubhouse three, four nights a week. I was in people's classes. I was teaching, but now I'm taking the next quarter to be a student. I want to be a student of stock market. You know, I'm learning options. I'm learning how to put like, so it goes in waves. So right. sometimes I'm a teacher and sometimes I'm a student. I've literally decided to buckle down and be a student for the next six months because along with real estate, start looking into stocks, start figuring out where you can park your money and it can continue to grow with less of your effort. Again, this real estate is a freaking monster. I get my ass beat every day from some way or another. I don't know how, but I come in here tired every day. <laughs> There's a bunch of, you know, transactions and drama and paperwork and materials and, you know, all that. It's a lifestyle. You know, I enjoy following. I have like a handful of investors who are my absolute fave. All of them are mostly men. Most of all of them are men. I like these men, these freaking investor <laughs> men. They're like so <laughs> radical and so easygoing and they'll give you their strategies and they'll teach you how to do things and they'll send contractors if you need them and you build a nice camaraderie. So just engage with other investors that are doing what you do. Follow them, take their classes, you know, just kind of build your own strategy based on what you hear and what you learn from everybody else. So did you give us the date? Did you say the date for the book? Oh, I don't have an official date. It's on an editor's desk right now. I'm really proud of myself, Anthony, about writing this book because I'm not a, I have ADHD. So sitting down, writing this book, I mean, I had to do it because people are reaching out to me, like asking, you know, pulling, like, how can we do this? What should we do? What should we do? What should we do? And I don't have time to respond to all the DMs. So I said, look, I'm going to put it in the book. You buy the book. What did you do to be able to sit down and write your book? It took me three years. I just exactly. Don't don't sleep on these authors, y'all. When they say they're <laughs> author, sitting down. First of all, I feel like the hardest part is when you write the book. You got to keep reading it. Well, so the point where you're like, I, I don't even want to read my own book no more. I don't. I don't. I didn't do that part. Like eventually, I just started writing. But the problem is the energy coming flow. So like one day I feel this way, another way I feel this way, and I just got to keep trying to build it. But I just throw it in there and then let somebody put it all together. They'll mesh it. And that's what you do. So that's the ease. That's the part. Finding, Jay-Z says it all the time. I'm not the best at everything, but I have the best team. <laughs> so when you have money, <laughs> you can buy a ghostwriter. You can buy an editor. You can buy everything you need to be a successful author. But, you know, I, I wanted to give it to my people. Like, I, I pretty much wrote my book. You know, I sat down with a Word document, and I dug deep. I went back to being um just a, a a worker bee nine to fiver when i was working my job and how i left from corporate america and um started to control my finances it's a great feeling when you know that you're feeding your family off of your own work right. like everything that you do is what you know you're using to fuel your family and culturally it is so much fun. Like I have clients and my accountant, he's also an investor. So we talk shit every day, all day about, <laughs> you see that deal came through, they crazy. Right. I got wholesalers, we're all friends, right? So I'm driving in the city one day, I'm checking on all my properties and all my clients' properties. And my accountant, he running into me in traffic, he beeping his horn, he checking on his properties. It's right. a life monopoly out here, guys. It feels good to it's see people make money, to know you're making money. And it's like, we live in life on our own terms. If we have a meeting to go to at four o'clock, we don't have to, you know, ask for permission to do this or do that. You have, you write your own schedule. Even though we talk about the drama, we talk about the pain and we talk about all the things that go wrong in real estate, it's really beautiful. And it affords you a lot of freedoms it affords you that gratification of knowing that you're putting food on your family's table and that nobody can take this money away from you. Like once you make money, like you're making a hundred thousand dollars per flip. I'm just saying that because you guys should set your bar that high, but you're making a hundred thousand dollars per flip. You're doing six, seven, eight flips a year. 
like think about that you know you're mm. running that money into other investment vehicles you're buying rentals you're buying large deals all day every day this is your life right like that in itself is goals you know what i mean so you know you don't have to work for somebody drag yourself to a job you hate nah well we well like i said we definitely appreciate you always bring the motivation and the, and the energy for us so we definitely looking forward to seeing are you how long till you finish the house I'm done. I, well, I'm working on a, right now I'm working on a rental and I'm trying to decide if I want to convert it into a duplex. So I'm working, I I personally think, you know, um, trying to do one at a time and getting out of them as fast as possible might be better than stacking them where you do four and five at a time. I per like to hurry up, do three, four months per renovation and then get on to the next one. That way I can give that particular renovation project my oh. whole you know, my undivided attention. I see a lot of investors do three, four at a time. And it's hard to keep track of that stuff. You know, you get right. burned out, things start falling apart. If you do one at a time, you get in and out within three or four months, you do the next one or whatever, you know, compound it, however you want to do it with your team. But um, I'm working on my rental right now. I The book should be done in the next few weeks. One of the things I'm not going to do is rush it because I just want it to be perfect and I want to make sure that um, I'm really giving the information to those that are looking to um, utilize some of the strategies. I always tell people all the time, I'm not an expert, but I just, uh, you know, this is what works for me. This is how I'm making money. So if you want to know how I'm making money, I tell you. <laughs> nah, that's what's up. But I guess we definitely appreciate it. I'm going to be looking forward to when you drop the book. We might have to, I don't know, we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do an event, something yeah. virtual do a special zoom meeting for you just for you to drop this book so yeah, don't forget follow follow karan at, at karan nicole um here we'll put it down here we, so you guys can see so we can stay connected in this journey Tinka dropped it we dropped it in there okay and also put it when i when i save this live i'm gonna put it in the comments so definitely don't forget next thursday we'll be back here 8 p.m uh, with another great guest. Honestly, I don't remember who was next week, but we already got him lined up. So definitely appreciate you, Karan. Awesome. Looking forward. I'm going to call you once I do my next six-figure flip, all right? I'm going to call uh, you. Shout out to Anthony for all this game he's giving you guys. So definitely stay connected to him. He's doing a great job. He's definitely one of the guys that I trust in the city that's making moves and really genuine dude. So good luck with everything that you do, Anthony. I'm always here to help. I pre well, no, I'm calling you because we won't. You gonna walk through this house and tell me where the gold faucet going, or if I'm gonna use the black. Where the gold faucet go? <laughs> <laughs> it go everywhere. Put it in everything. <laughs> no, we good. I got you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a good one. Good night.